Um, I am Vasila Sertanovich, Cross Departmental Director of Contemporary Art and Initiative, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all on Zoom. Um, next time we'll do this in person. It is even my greater pleasure to introduce our speakers, our guests today, Miguel Falamir, joining us from Madrid, the director of El Prado <laughs> Museum, and Dorothy Kozinski, director and CEO of the Phillips Collection. And of course, my colleague Albert, um, Miguel Albero from the, the head of the cultural program at the office of, um, I always get this cultural office of the Embassy of Spain. I always want to say the cultural office of Spain. Uh, we are here as in our first transatlantic conversation about museums today, about cultural diplomacy, about art. But a little bit before I introduce the speakers, I wanted to give a context of why are we doing this? When I said the first transatlantic conversation, what brought us together here is our partnership, the partnership that is a lasting partnership between the Phillips Collection and the uh, Spanish um, Cultural Office that has been, I think, ongoing for about a decade. And the most recent occasion of this partnership was the project that you saw the video of, and that is Daniel Canogar Amalgama, a project that was launched first at the Museo del Prado in 2019, celebrating their anniversary, and currently is on view at the Phillips uh, through January 2nd, celebrating our 100th anniversary. So we have a double context, our respective um, anniversaries, 200 years of Museo del Prado and 100th anniversary of El, uh, museum, our, our museum, the Phillips collection. And we'll talk about that, but this was an occasion of getting together, joining our forces and uh, presenting Daniel Kalinogar's work concurrently. It's on view. Um, a little longer at, at your place, Miguel, right? And it's going to be up at the Phillips, as I said, through January 2nd. So um, with that, we'll be, you know, having this very informal conversation for about an hour. Uh, please have your questions for uh, in chat, and we'll leave that for the end. And um, we'll talk about, or we'll have Miguel Falamir and Dorothy talk about museums today, um, about what they are presenting, what are the future projects, what are the challenges of the museum take from a presentation of art, from conservation of art, from the building future collection, from expanding the audiences, about the relevance of the museums today, and all those things that we are facing as we're coming out of the pandemic that hit us all in a different ways. So with that, I, I would like to turn the Zoom screen to Miguel Albero, who will introduce Miguel Falomir. I will take it over, introduce Dorothy, and then you will have two directors, tete a tete, talking about all these things that I mentioned. Thank you all for joining us. Miguel, I turn it to Thank you. Thank you, Vesela. Uh, I'll be very brief. It's a pleasure to be here with you, a pleasure to have done this uh, very interesting program together with Daniel Canogar. work. It's been, uh, we've had a lot of comments from people. They're very, happy to have to see this piece of art in both institutions and uh, obviously for us it's always an honor and a pleasure to work with and it's such an, a prestigious institution as the philip collection very happy to have here today miguel falomir that as you know is the director of our most important cultural institution in spain which is the prado i uh, i uh, invite everyone to join uh, the prado's friends which is a foundation that exists in spain but also in the united states and uh, he's here with us. He's, uh, he's been director of El Prado since uh, 2017. He joined the Prado 20 years before uh, as chief of the Italian and French paint department in El Prado. And he also has a history with the States because he, he was a, he a Fulbright postdoctoral fellowship and fellow in the Institute of Fine Arts of uh, New York. And he was also here uh, in DC for two years. He was the Andrew Mellon professor at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts of the National Gallery uh, of Art. So uh, I'm, I, don't think, I don't think it needs much more introduction. Uh, I give you back the floor, Vesela, saying again, thank you for this marvelous collaboration. I think it's, it's gonna be, uh, we'll have to follow doing things together because I always say that uh, what we need to do is bring our artists to the local institutions. So, you brought Daniel Canogar here, and we just helped with that with this show that he had done for El Prado. Thank you. 
Thank you. And thank everybody at the Spanish uh, Cultural Center for enthusiasm, for hard work, for good spirit, for, for collegiality. It's been a pleasure. It's always been a pleasure, but this time uh, probably more than ever. And we're also grateful to you to, to make it happen. It was one of the easiest, the smoothest, uh, the most pleasurable collaboration we've done so far. And I will just jump in and introduce Dorothy. For many of us, I'm sure who are on the call, um, no need for special introduction. Dorothy has been a Radenberg director and CEO of the Philips since 2008. She hired me, she's still my boss, and um, I, I am delightful to be able, this is I think the first time Dorothy that I'm introducing you, usually it's the other way around. Uh, Dorothy and Miguel Valomir share a lot of experiences from the past and uh, including the Institute in New York, but maybe they will touch on that in person. Uh, before joining the Phillips, Dorothy was at the Dallas Museum of Art. And before that, she was in Basel, um, Switzerland, working uh, and establishing Douglas Cooper collection of Cubist art. In uh, August of 2013, uh, Dorothy was appointed by President Barack Obama to the National Council on the Humanities. And in December 2017, she was recognized by the ambassador of Italy with the order of an Italian star. It distinct distinction recognized for her outstanding contribution to the arts and promotion of Italian culture. And not just Italian, I wanna add, uh, and here we are witnessing that. She cur currently serves on the board of the Sherman Fairchild Foundation and the Morris and Gwendolyn Caffords Foundation. Uh, Dr. Kaczynski received her BA from Yale University, MA and PhD from the Institute of Fine Art. New York University. With that uh, introduction, I welcome you again all, and uh, Dorothy, take it away. Thank you, Basil. Thank you for those uh, lovely introductions. Yes, uh, uh, I think the world of art history and the museum world is very small, so uh, Basil mentioned that we shared uh, the Institute in our respective pasts, and you spent time at CASVA, um, and, um, and I, I, it dawns on me now, I should thank my colleague, uh, the director of the Prado for lending a painting, Luis de Morales painting of the Virgin Dolorosa, which is currently in our Picasso, early Picasso show that's it, in Toronto now and comes to us in February. So this give and take um, is I think the lifeblood of our work in museums, but also, um, is really essential for um, the, the sort of richness of our work in museums. So thank you for the, that loan and for your collegiality. So well, uh, Dorothy, let me start thanking Miguel for his very generous words and to the Phillips Collection for inviting me to participate in this transatlantic Zoom connection. So I'm very happy to be here. Well, the, the point of departure is the uh, Daniel Kanagar Amalgama that some of my trustees uh, saw on the facade of the Prado celebrating 200 years of your grand institution. And so it became a kind of uh, special project for many of them to uh, find a way to bring um, our Philips Amalgama into our collection and into the Philips. So tell me about, um, the motivation behind that commission for the Prado. Um, why Kanogar and why a digital uh, piece to help uh, mark a 200th anniversary of such a venerable um, collection? Well, as, as, as you know, and the Prado turned 200 years in, in 2019. It was founded in 1819. And for the occasion, we designed a, a very ambitious celebratory program, which included more than 200 activities throughout the country. But we had, since the very beginning, a very clear idea about how we would like to start and end the bicentennial. And we wanted to do something beyond the walls of the institution. So for the opening, we used the, the main facade for the museum as a huge screen where we invited some contemporary artists to reflect on our collection. And, uh, and for the ending of the, of, the, of the bicentennial that ended the very same day that we turned 200 
years on November 19, 2019, um, we were looking for a grand finale. So we knew about Daniel works and he knew about our interest in something close to what he was developing lately. So he, he, he came to my office and we began to discuss the possibility of doing what at the end he did, the, 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 the amalgama. No? For us, it was important because we wanted an artist, a contemporary artist that could be able to reflect on the exhibition, but at the same time, who could be able to, to project it beyond the walls and to reach a wider audience. And that was our main goal. I think that was Daniel's main intention. And well, at the end, I think that it was a huge success. You know? Besides that, I, I truly love his, his, his proposal, you know? this, this idea that how the first this um, aleatory work with our collection, you know? how you didn't know sometimes when you think on a venerable institution such as the Museo del Prado, you think that in, in order where there is no space for improvisation, where there is no space for surprise. So somehow this, the way how the images that Daniel was projecting in, in the facade and how it changed, how it uh, liquefies and how transforming one to the other. So that was a, a very attractive and innovative way to present our collection. Um, it was something that it was some sort of game, but it fits perfectly with the spirit of the ending of the celebration. <laughs> and then, you know, I, I, I devoted most of my time to Titian and his mythological paintings, and it reminded me of its metamorphosis, no? the way how <laughs> one subject transforms in a different one. So. All this together explains um, the, the about the, the reason behind the, this yeah. very, I think, profitable relationship between Canogar and, and, and the Museo. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I love that reference um, that, that you brought up of Ovid's metamorphosis. Um, you mentioned well, first of all, it, it's it's an amalgam of many, many images from a, your huge collection. It's projected on the outside and you with the intent of um, connecting with, attracting. I almost, because his, I think of Kanagar's work as seductive, um, mm -hmm. that you're seducing the uh, broader audiences. And talk, I know that for us, um, here in Washington, um, I think any any museum, you know, it's how to attract a younger audience, a more diverse audience, how to engage um, um, uh, individuals on many different platforms. So is that um, a preoccupation, a concern, a project that you are pursuing in terms of building um, a love affair between the Prado and a broader uh, Spanish or international audience? Absolutely. I, um, I think the, 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 the fact that the, the Prado collection is in a building that it's probably the masterpiece of Spanish neoclassicism. Neo it's, it's an impressive, imposing building, but it's a, it's a building that somehow keep average people from outside, no? It's, it's many, uh, many, many, many Madrileños uh, have told me, you know, when I, when I stand in front of the facade, I have the feeling that this is something so important that uh, it's, it's alien to me, that I'm not going to feel comfortable inside the, 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 these, these walls, no? Beyond this, this facade with these uh, columns, classical columns. So it's, I think it's, uh, the Prado is an institution that it has a, a, a triple dimension. No? It's, it's an international one. It's one of the most important collections of all masters in, in the world. It has a national dimension. It's the jewel of the crown of the Spanish cultural system, but it's also a local institution. And this proximity is something that we have not to forget. And how to attract these uh, Madrileños, Spaniards, or citizens from the world who might be curious about our collections 
but that they feel that they might not feel comfortable. No, so I think that at least in the way I I I, I think I think that the contemporary artists are quite important in this effort for tending bridges between the building bridges between the the collection and the because they have the tools the the to convey what these artists from the past uh, uh, to a, a current audience no so and and I think that the the that, that's how we I like to to work with with contemporary artists we are working with with many uh, young talented artists under 30 35 but we are working with them with our education department because I think that they they know they know how to transmit to the younger generations what their predecessors did centuries ago. You have to think that all of our artists pass away at least hundred years ago, but we believe that their their art still matters for a contemporary audience. Well, I've found in my, what will it be, I guess, 14 years, uh, this coming April of my directorship at the Phillips, um, it's a delicate balance. I totally agree with you that uh, contemporary art, first of all, it's it's the expression of our time, uh, times, and it's very understandable and natural that we are uh, excited and engaged with that expression, but it's a delicate balance between those individuals who are passionate, uh, I almost um, um, gripped by a kind of nostalgia for the Phillips of their youth, yeah. or for, you know, people will say to me, you moved the Renoir. How could you move the Renoir from its room? And my answer is, well, it never had its room. Yeah. And um, we are blessed to have a, a kind of Genesis story um, written by our founder, who was very, um, I would say, a, a liberal thinker in terms of move things around, lend things, change, add. So I felt that he gave us a pathway to establish that, that delicate balance. Um, do you find some of your tried and true supporters or perhaps, and this uh, is something I'd love to explore, especially because I had decades of experience working in museums in Europe, but um, is, uh, you know, are your more uh, traditional audiences um, um, supportive or sometimes a bit uh, dubious? Uh, is the government behind you? Are they saying, my God, follow me or what are you doing there? Well, I, I first I agree with you. It's, it's not easy, no? The relationship between a, a, a mostly old master museum as such as the Prado and contemporary art. I remember when I was appointed, uh, every single journalist asked me the same question. How is going to be your relationship with contemporary art? And I I, I told them, and, and what I still think, it's that the, the Prado is not a contemporary art museum. There are great art contemporary museums in Spain, in Madrid, for instance, the, the, the Reina Sofia. So I'm not interested in every contemporary artist. I'm not interested on um, contemporary art per se. I'm interested on those contemporary artists for whom the all masters matter. So those who are fully aware about the history of art, about the past, about the art that houses the Museo del Prado, and they want to establish some sort of dialogue with our collections. So that's why we felt very, very comfortable with Daniel Canogar. And yes, well, we have a, a very huge audience and it's quite different and some of our visitors are very, very conservative. <laughs> Others are less conservative. So, so I guess that someone sometimes think that we go too far and some others who think that we are 
too short. So, yeah. so, but I think that this is the way to do that. And I have to say that nobody, absolutely nobody, criticized uh, Daniel's Amalgama project. Well, I think that uh, it was, uh, again, very seductive, and I think uh, uh, an excellent choice, and thank you for inspiring us. Um, it makes me think um, uh, maybe we could explore a bit about technology, and I mean, the fact that his is such an innovative, um, algorithmically you know, generative uh, digital piece and here we are having an international conversation via the absolutely essential but fundamentally dreaded Zoom room. Uh, so how has, um, how ha what role does technology play in your work right now at the Prado? Well, I can't imagine mine or your or any museum in the world without the support of technology. We are in a high technology era and, and we have to um, um, understand that it's, it's absolutely important. No? And uh, it was important before the pandemic. It became very, very important during the pandemic and it will be important in the in the future i think i don't see any threat in technology i think that is not going to replace what is the experience to be in front of a work of of art and i think technology is an ally it's something that um help us to convey our message to the wider audiences and many times what one of the things that well, first, technology has evolved in an unexpected way in the last 20 years. I remember the first time that I had access to the web page of a, of a museum. I used it just for looking for the address and, <laughs> and the schedule. And, the, and right now, you can find in the web page absolutely everything. You can learn a lot of history of art in the, uh, in, in, in the web page. And uh, through the web pages, the museums serve their activities with the public. Um, to me, you know, during the pandemic, mostly during the very first, very hard months of the pandemic, it was amazing to see how you could be close, but you were able to keep being in touch with your public through the, the the technology so i think that it's 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 great i cannot imagine uh any institution in the 21st century without uh, technology and what we have to do and to learn is how to use for the better purposes yeah well um uh, the other day I was in a conversation with Lonnie Bunch this uh secretary of the Smithsonian Museums and um, we were reminiscing about our earliest uh, museum jobs in the late 70s or, um, you know, when there were no education departments in museums. There certainly was no digital uh, 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 area. And in, um, in the States, and uh, I would like to touch on the differences about how museums function within um, uh, this country and yours, um, but there certainly were no development offices. So, you know, the whole industry of the museum has changed so radically. I think especially in this country where those external functions are so, um, so important, so fundamental to achieving the mission of a museum, education, outreach, fundraising. Um, it's a little bit different in Europe in most European countries in terms of um, there, at least, you have a ministry of culture and you no. have that fundamental support and um, in a support financially, but also I think societally that culture, the arts and education is um, seen as um, almost like a, um, a, a right, a societal, um, fundamental that is um, promoted and endorsed. Um, 
I, I wonder if you might comment on that uh, relationship. Well, I I could say that it's true that it's 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 I would not say that the mission of the museums are different are different in each side of the of the Atlantic, but I would say that the the, the, the whole cultural system uh, and the way how it is financed it's quite different in the states that in most of Europe or at least in continental Europe, England is maybe something in between the um, the two models. Uh, but it's also true that is the, the the model is the two models are becoming closer. Uh, I have to say that um, uh, I remember when I joined the Museo del Prado twenty five years ago, the hundred percent of our budget came from the government, and every single um, euro then it didn't exist euro, the peseta that we made went straight to the Minister of Culture. We were unable, we didn't, the, the, the government, the, the, the legal framework didn't allow us any sort of freedom or autonomy for um, rising ourselves or looking for some sort of economic support. This changed in 2003 when the Prado was the first cultural institution that got its own law. A law that allowed us to raise money and to administrate it. And this law um, arrived in a very, very, you know, positive time in terms of economic development. You know, everybody had money, Spain was had money too. So for a while it was it was great. It was like a fairy tale, you know, every every million we made, every million more than the government gave to us. So it was great until the crisis of 2008 arrived. Mm -hmm. That things changed in a very dramatic way. Every million we made, every million that the government gave us less. So as a result of that, when we celebrated our bicentennial, the Prado was self-financing itself up to a 72%, what is quite unusual for a European institution. Uh, well, every year we had more visitors, so we were making more money with the ticketing. And uh, we, well, we were happy, we were quite stressed with this system because we, we realized that what's going to happen if something wrong happens. And what nobody could expect back then is what was going to happen. So when the pandemic arrived, we lost our main source of income. We, we, we almost, almost uh, collapsed. And that's when the many Spaniards found out that they were not paying for the museum, that the tourists, the, the Koreans, the Americans were paying for the institution. Uh, so the, 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 the government understood it, and I have to say that the response of the government has been um, extraordinarily positive. In two years, the government has tripled the assignation to the Prado, so we have got extra funds for the uh, last stage of the expansion process of the Prado, the so-called Hall of Reals. But if, if I can say that the pandemic has had something positive, is the fact that the, the Spaniards and the Spanish society have realized that they, they, they have to contribute to sustain the product. At least I'm not saying that we have to get all our funds from the government, but I think that a 50-50, it's a very good relationship. So yeah, that's how things have changed throughout the last two decades in Spain. That's, that's a fascinating um, story. Um, you know, of uh, movement in one direction. I mean, uh, if you were self-financing up to 72%, it really is more like a US museum. Yeah, yeah that's and, what my colleagues in the yeah, States and they, and <laughs> told they, me, you know? And they, they, um, the uh, impact of the pandemic is, is fascinating, um, fascinating story. When I was talking with Lonnie Bunch a, a couple of weeks ago, um, we were talking about something he had said about um, that the muse a museum is not a community center, but it had better be the center of the community. the community. And I think he was referencing in that 
nutshell, a, uh, you know, the panoply of different urgent issues, um, social justice, um, um, maybe uh, climate uh, change urgencies. And I wonder um, if those um, issues of our time preoccupy you and your colleague at the Prado. Do you tackle, avoid, or plunge into those complex and urgent social issues? We tackle of these issues because we are part of the society <laughs> where we are. And so we cannot ignore the issues that preoccupy most of our fellow citizens. So, you know, this is quite important for us, all these, these, these issues about climate change, about a more equal approach to culture to open to a wider audiences. Many times journalists ask me about the, the, the demographic gap, you know, the fact that the, the, our visitors are getting older and I'm less concerned about it. I think that somehow it always has been in this way, you know, the, 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 the uh, many, um, visitors discover museums when they are in their late 30s, 40s, no? And, and I am more concerned about the social background gap. That's the one that concerns me more, you know, the fact that when we check about the social background of our visitors, we always get the very same profile. And medium upper class, you know, with the uh, university studies. Um, many times they have visited the museum because their parents have taken them to the museum. And we that's when we realize that the, 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 we don't um, open the, our public, that there are millions of uh, citizens in Madrid, that's where we are, that they have never visited the Prado. And what is even worse, that they, they don't even consider the possibility of visiting the Prado. So our main uh, aim right now is to reach this population, to work with them. Of course, you know, the education department, it's the, the best tool we know for doing so. And we are implementing these, these programs in the last years. And I have to say that with very good results. Yeah, it's, um, I think that that uh, preoccupies m most museums today, how to, um, and you're right, education, the outreach for us, um, the outreach to um, public schools to really um, teach the teachers to feel confident in using art objects to um, teach their core subjects better, history or writing, even mathematics. We've done a lot of experimentation. I think that's one of the most um, um, uh, compelling areas of, of our work. I wanna turn to um, conservation because I mentioned, maybe it was uh, just at the outset, about the loan of, of the Luis de Morales to our early Picasso show. And the entire premise of that project evolves out of the conservation studio, essentially. Mm -hmm. of, um, I mean, it goes back now uh, at least a decade of, well, there was a faint um, glimpse of a painting beneath the painting. Um, mm -hmm. And then as over the years, and as the uh, capacity to see more clearly what was that image under the image? It, it evolved into an entire project of examining major Picassos to, to sort of um, expand the puzzle and to piece together sources and references and evolution of, of uh, his uh, style and uh, paint, uh, painting technique at that time. So um, talk just a little bit about the conservation at the Prado. Well, um, what you were telling us is a very good example of how technology helps our daily work in museums. Uh, well, I have to say that first, we, we have a very large 
on a very good conservation department. In fact, we have four different conservation departments. The largest one that is the painting department, uh, another of works on paper, a uh, third one entirely devoted to decorative arts and sculpture, and the fourth just focus on frames. So we have these four plus the laboratory where and the, where the, all the, the x-rays and the and the samples of pigments are taken and studied. So this is something that we are very proud. It is one of the leading conservation workshops in, 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 in the world. And we are happy because we did this conservation workshop not just work with our collections, but also teach um, conservators from everywhere. So we have, we have fellows that are coming from the States, from Mexico, mostly from Latin America, but also from different countries in Europe. We are working with other foreign institutions such as the Getty, with the Getty conservation programs. So it's, it's something that we are particularly proud. And then I have to say that we are very lucky that probably we have the best preserved all master collections in the world. So the, 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 the particularly our paintings are in an average uh, outstanding condition because most of these paintings have had just two owners during their lives. First the Spanish crown, then the Spanish government. Right. Most of them have been under the same climate conditions for 400 years, always in Madrid. And as you know, that helps a lot <laughs> in order to keep the collection in good shape. So yeah, no, no, we are very, very lucky. And of course, we, you know, we, we are constantly introducing all these new technologies. It's amazing how much they have improved in the last three decades, no? the, since yeah. you think in the first X-rays machines and the ultra high tech new machines we, we have. And, and I'm sure we will have to renew and change them in, in a couple of years but yeah. but but yeah no no it's it's something that we are proud happy and, and happy to serve our knowledge and expertise with colleagues from everywhere in the world yeah no, I, i've always found it maybe it goes back to the institute of fine arts where the conservation was you know right important. There yeah. and part of our formation but i think that a lot of the most interesting new knowledge derives from that partnership between curators and conservators. Um, uh, talking about the demographic of our visitors um, and thinking a little bit about the demographic of, of we, the museum leaders, uh, and how do we change that? How do we bring diversity into the field? Um, it seems that uh, recently, um, and perhaps it's simply a matter of uh, generational uh, changes, but people turning to me asking me, well, what are the characteristics uh, required of a museum director um, today? And um, which is an interesting question. I think when we started out, it would have been a PhD in art history. Mm -hmm. It would have been a curatorial background. And now, well, you know, it might be uh, both of those things, but it could be, um, you know, a more robust um, sort of uh, uh, culturally engaged uh, artistic practice, or it could be a perspective on uh, technology or, uh, you know, a scholarly evolution that um, embeds art into broader social issues. So what, what advice would you give or how would you answer that question of the, the key characteristics for museum leadership of tomorrow? Uh, frankly, uh, I don't think that is a, an easy question, no? And I, I yeah. think that for, for, for many reasons, first, because it's amazing how, how fast things change in our world, no? And then because I think that the, the museums are becoming, at least in the 20, 30 last years, more and more relevant in our society. So that means that the directors, the leaders of the museums have to be fully aware about the impact that their words or their actions might have 
into the society. The, uh, every time, every year we have more and more public and we occupy more pages in the, in the newspapers, in the social media. So being a director now, it's, it's more complex. It's more difficult, I have to say, that probably it was um, three, four, five decades ago. Uh, probably then, you know, a more scientific profile was, 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 was the profile that almost every of our predecessors had. Uh, but I think that now it's important to, to, to have some knowledge about the collection, history of art and the collection of the museum that you are going to direct. But, but it's not, I think, the, the only requirement that you have to fulfill in order to become a, an important. I would say that social sensibility, it's important. I think that you have to be aware about the impact that what your institution does might have in the society. And, and, and yeah, and then I have to be, to be able to transform yourself at the same time that the, the society is transforming. So I think that, that at the end of the process, you are not isolated far from the main trends in society. I'm not saying that you have to follow every trend because if you follow trends, you are always to arrive late because <laughs> you are after the, but I think that this kind of more, you know, sensibility mm -hmm. towards what it's not only inside, but also outside the museum, it's important. How you get these skills? Mm -hmm. That's something I don't know. I don't think that is something that you can learn in the university, in a master on, on curatorial studies. I don't think, I would say that experience is important. You know, it's, 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 it's okay. once you have been working for, for years and decades in museums, you, you realize that what is important, what is not important. And I would say that, yeah, you have to start having some knowledge about history of art mm -hmm. and then to develop this sensibility towards the, the others and what yeah, it's no, around I, you. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Experience seems to um, be such a key factor. You know, uh, I always, we have a, an internship and fellowship program. We, uh, within the last several years, we found the funding so that we make sure that they are always paid internships. So that also has to do with our commitment to diversity, that we can open up those opportunities. But my first little baby museum job was way back when at the Guggenheim, it was, a, it was an internship. And it makes me think of a mutual friend uh, Lola Jimenez Blanco. She was an intern at the Phillips. Did you know that? Yeah, I know, uh, I know, I know that. I know that. And and then ends up having a very key position. Um, uh, Minister uh, of Cultural Affairs in Spain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, it's 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 actually uh, fascinating that um, I think those early um, on the job experiences where you observe and absorb and uh, you know, establish a set of models for your uh, experiences and perspectives, I think are really uh, uh, essential. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so um, I'm looking at my colleague, Vesela. Vesela, do we have any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. I, of course, I always have questions, but I welcome any questions. Please uh, um, join us in this conversation. But I'd like to ask a question maybe as a start off. Um, I have many, but uh, let's start with the collection itself. I think I would love to hear from you collecting into the future or for posterity. Yes, our museums are very different. Uh, we do incorporate contemporary art in our programming more so than El Prado, but you also, Daniel was one of the first, one of the recent acquisitions mm -hmm. of contemporary art. How are we looking into collecting for the future on both ends? Well, if we are talking just specifically about collecting contemporary art, um, no, in general, art, well, in general. Let, let, let me start with contemporary art because that would provide an explanation why Daniel was one of the very first contemporary um, artists we we collect. It's because um, in the past we couldn't 
<laughs> call it contemporary art because the collections in Spain were divided. You know, the 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 art of those artists born before Picasso belong to the Prado. <laughs> those after Picasso belong to the Reina Sofia. This 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 is this. This difference doesn't exist anymore. So we got our first Picasso uh, a few months uh, ago, and, and we can collect contemporary art. It's not my, it's not our, um, I don't know, main um, reason. No, we are a, mostly a collection of contemporary art. Of, of all masters and what we try to do is to reinforce what we already have and try to fill the holes the gaps we have in the collection this is a very peculiar collection this is a this is a collection that it was mostly done in the 16 17 and the first half of the 18th century by kings who were collectors and who didn't care about uh history of art he they didn't pretend to provide a comprehensive approach of Western painting starting in the 14th century and ending in their days. But they collect the artists they like and they didn't collect the artists they, they didn't like. As a result of that, what we have, we have more than any other institution in the world, but we have some important gaps in our collection. We, can, we have 99 works by Rubens, but just one by Rembrandt. And uh, we have the largest collection of, of uh, Venetian Renaissance paintings, but we have very few non-Venetian Renaissance paintings. Uh, well, what we try to do is to fill these gaps in our collection and expand it in some geographical areas that we are not represented in the museum, but what we think are important. For instance, Latin American art. Mm -hmm. the, this is something that for us is important. It is important because, uh, well, for 300 years, works from the America were displayed in the very same spaces where the Velázquez and Goya did. And also because we have a growing uh, community of Latin American population in Spain. And I think that, that it's a uh, interesting and intelligent way to attract them to the museum. Thank you. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I was sort of stunned by the similarity. I never thought I would be uh, saying this similarity between certain fundamental character of the Prado collection and the Phillips in only in the sense that uh, the our founder he didn't answer to anything. He wasn't following art history or the isms. He wasn't filling in gaps. He bought the artists he loved. So it's it's a, in in that sense, um, there's a certain kind of clarity of of vision uh, that drives both collections. And then well, they're totally different, of course. I have to say that these are the museums that I like. The way that. Uh, are more passionate museums that they the, the the ones that they were done by by collectors who love art and and if you like art you don't like every kind of art you have your the the, the artists that you prefer this is a museum that it was not done by art historians <laughs> as many other uh, museums in uh, in the world that you know opened by the mid 19th century when the art history was already a university discipline and the first curators were art historians. And what they tried to do was to provide to their public with this comprehensive ap approach to the history of art. So they say, well, we need a, a, a Venetian painting, a Florentine painting, a CNS painting, a Roman painting, and they move from one chapter to the other. While ours is different, you know, I it, it is the outcome of the passion for certain artists uh, in the past. And, but that's the kind of, of, of collections and museums that I love, such as yours or, or, yeah. or mine. <laughs> well, Duncan Phillips was very funny. I mean, he wrote uh, sort of against the isms. You know, he wasn't interested yeah. in one of this and one of that. So no, it, it's fascinating kind of commonality. Yeah. And I, I have sort of related question in terms of what do you think of the model of blockbuster shows going into the future? 
<laughs> is that sustainable given yeah the the, the conditions we're in <laughs> I, I i think that's when 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 journalists like to to ask what's what's has changed with the pandemic you know and and, and i always answer the same that probably nothing is going to change as a result of the pandemic but what the pandemic is doing is accelerating certain trends that started before one of them is the 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 the, the end of the blockbuster or at least the, 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 the they are going to change i think that they have already changed or at least you know from my own experience what we thought that it was a blockbuster in 2000 is not exactly what it's what we think is a blockbuster right now our current blockbusters are half the size of the blockbusters <laughs> of the past i think that as you say are unsustainable are becoming more and more expensive i'm absolutely sure that exhibitions are going to be even more expensive after the pandemic so I don't know if you are the most wealthy institution in the world, maybe you can afford these blockbusters exhibitions. We can't. And I don't think that if you have a, an excellent and very large collection of we have, there are many ways to explore that collection. Of course, you always have to rely on loans from other institutions when you design an exhibition, but, but always you know, combining them with the work from your own collection. I think that's the, the best way to, to, to explore, you know, new ways to, to understand your collection. And, and then at the end, you know, it is also true that the, I think the model was already exhausted and not just because it was becoming more and more expensive. I think that from an intellectual point of view, blockbusters, doesn't add anything, you know, and, and you are seeing the same, the very same paintings in different institutions. You see the catalogs and all of them look like the same. And, yeah. you know, I think that both from uh, an economic and scientific point of view, I think that blockbusters don't have a yeah. brilliant future, or at least I, I, I don't agree. foresee Eat. Yeah, I agree. Sort of an exhausted model, um, uh, you know, sort of a trying to sustain um, a frenzy around certain fads or tastes. I mean, in this country, especially, I would say around impressionism for yeah. the longest time. And I think that might have finally had its um, natural death. Um, on the other hand, to, as you say, to probe. Uh, the collection, um, you know, by adding, be it conservation derived new knowledge or, you know, really intensive uh, scholarly inquiry, that adds something. You start to add to the, your fundamental understanding of what, what you uh, are charged to care with. Yeah. But and then I would say that we don't need to do a blockbusters exhibitions but also due to the profile of our public, you know, in, in, in normal conditions in the pre-COVID era, the 70% of our visitors were foreigners. Mm -hmm. They were interested mostly on the permanent collection, not in the exhibitions. So, and they are the ones who pay the tickets. So uh, I don't need to attract, you know, big numbers to the exhibitions because they are coming for the a permanent collection. So if I were just a Kunsthalle, an exhibition center, you know, of course, I would have to relay on the tickets of those who visit the exhibitions, but that's not right. my case where most of my visitors are coming for the permanent collection. That gives me some freedom in order to design my exhibitions. Dorothy, anything to elaborate? No, I don't think so. I mean, our model is different. Um, it, you know, I think that the profundity, the depth of the Prado's permanent collection, I mean, you could spend, uh, it, it is very nurturing and sustaining. Um, uh, and uh, I think over a lo long period of time. So that's, it's a little bit different. Um, we have one question from the public and, um, and that is, I'm reading it. Um, 
what uh, will or when the um, uh, the Spanish Ley de Mese Najo will be reality? How would that help El Prado collection? I don't know if I am the one who has to answer that question. Maybe Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> but this this is uh, this is what um, what makes Spain different from any other um, developed country. I have to say, not just the uh, United States, but also our neighbors in Europe. I wish that I could have a lay the mecenado as the French one, for instance, you know, not just looking for Anglo-Saxon models. But this is something that, frankly, I don't know. I, I'm working every day and I never think about the possibility of having this kind of law <laughs> because it's true that what, what is what is intriguing is the fact that every political party agrees about this law. <laughs> Nobody is against this law. But the problem is that once they arrive into power, the law <laughs> doesn't come. And, and uh, so, but if you talk with, I would say with every politician, all of them agree how important it would be uh, that it's absolutely necessary, but then it doesn't arrive. So if you are, uh, if you are working in the cultural is seen in Spain. Uh, my my recommendation is don't rely on the future <laughs> mecenazgo law because you can retire and the <laughs> and the law is not is not coming. What what's happened is that that for instance, in uh, if I compare with other countries, it's quite different. You know, we get we get some we have several sponsors. But all of them are private companies because they they get a tiny benefit, but they get some sort of return in terms of publicity, in terms of social uh, prestige. Uh, while we don't have any contribution from private donors, I think that's what makes the big difference between Spain and, for instance, the states, and that's what put us in a weaker <laughs> position, uh, for instance, in terms of collecting, you know, <laughs> I wish that I could have the, the funds that the, the American museums have for, for acquisitions. Yeah. Interesting. So there was a, a, a question from someone about the phenomenon of new private museums. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm shepherding a, what was a private collection now in its hundredth uh, anniversary as a public institution. Um, but you know, um, I guess in, in, um, in Madrid, there's the Thyssen collection, which evolved out of a pr private collection, or I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the wonderful um, Goya show in, in Basel, at the Byler Museum right now. Um, I hope I get to well, see we, that. Well, I, I, uh, I attended the opening two, three weeks ago, and I think it's a, it's a great exhibition. Yeah. And of course, we have collaborated with, with the Basel. They, they were very supportive with us during our bicentennial. We did an exhibition on Giacometti, probably the only great 20th century artist who never visited the, <laughs> the Prado. So that's why we wanted to do an exhibition on, on him and, and the Vagular was very supportive. And in return, we, we have uh, support this exhibition. But I guess the, the, I think if I understood the question correctly, it was um, kind of posing the question, what is the role of the private museum? And there seem to be many now, though of course that was also a phenomenon at the turn of the 19th to 20th century, I'm, I'm just thinking in my neighborhood, so to speak. I mean, the, the Phillips, the Barnes, the Frick, uh, the Gardner Museum, now very recently, Glenstone Museum, uh, just outside of Washington. And in, in um, Europe, maybe it's less prevalent, but not unknown. I mean, um, uh, Byler is a, is a great example. Yeah. Um, what do you think of that vis-a-vis -vis the, the more traditional model of a, of a, of a more public museum uh, that grows, um, 
well, as you pointed out, in Spain, it would grow, collections grow out of the uh, patronage of the, of the royal house, um, you know, different histories in different places. But is there a, is there a role uh, for the private museum today? Well, in Spain, there were and there are private museums, you know. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, in the Fundación Marc, that owns a couple of museums and who has developed an extraordinary program, contemporary art, mostly, con and not, but not only in contemporary art. So there are, you can find private museums as you can find in the States or in Europe. But again, the problem is how to, first, how to sustain it. Okay. And because you don't have this uh, legal framework that gives you benefits for opening a, a museum. So, you know, it's, it's, it's true um, mecenatism, you know, in the sense that you are not getting any return from the government if you um, invest in, in arts or you invest in science. It's not just about art, but about in, in, in science too. So exists, there, there, are, there are private institutions, but as a result of that, I think that we cannot compete in number and quality of our private museums with those that you can find in France, in Germany, and in the United States. If we finally get this law and we have a proper legal framework, I think that um, we will in a few years have a variety of private museums comparable with other, at least European continental countries. Interesting. Well, I'm just watching time. We're a little over uh, one o'clock, but I would like to ask Miguel Albero, uh, does he have a final question or a comment? Oh, just about what they, what they were saying. It's true that what uh, Miguel has said, we're, we have become a, an anomaly, no? Because we don't have to compare with the Anglo-Saxon countries, just with the countries like France, which has not that same model. Uh, but uh, the problem is that the state is not, the public field is not supporting any more culture as it did before. I'm talking about, for example, all these uh, cajas de ahorro, these banks that had foundations and are, they were very important in the in the in the network uh, of the different small cities in Spain, and they're not anymore. But we have not uh, given, as Miguel was saying, we have not given the private institutions, the private firms, all the private donors, the tools to to uh, getting getting the the game to play in the game. So uh, uh, I think that's that's it, it has to happen. But I'm 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 a little bit skeptical as Miguel is because it's it's it. We've been told that this was going to happen so many times, <laughs> but it, when it does, <laughs> we don't know if we will we'll believe it. But anyway. Uh, when it, I, I think it's going to happen uh, sometime, but uh, uh, I don't know when. No? So, uh, well, let's end on the positive note, um, <laughs> on the note of uh, celebration of 100 years or 200 years, our partnership. And as a grand finale, I want to say, as uh, Miguel Palomir mentioned at the beginning, that Daniel Kanogar was the big um the, the grand finale of your 200th anniversary. Uh, this is our grand finale of our partnership. At this point, at this conversation between the directors is the grand finale of uh, the joint celebration and opening of Daniel Kanogar, the receptions in two places. So I'm grateful to all of you for uh, joining the grand finale and celebrating uh, the future with the hope that the future brings us all we want. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a enough. wonderful afternoon and yeah. the partnership to continue. I appreciate sure. the conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Take care. Be, be well.